We have learned a lot this afternoon about Churchill's military career. He was proud to be a cavalry officer and lieutenant in the 4th Queen's Own Hussars. It's probably fair to say that the vocation of being a cavalry officer has undergone some changes in the last 120 years. The successor reg regiment to Churchill's is the Queen's Royal Hussars, and we are lucky enough to have a strong contingent protecting us here today, including the regiment's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Shan. I was fortunate enough to be invited to speak to the regiment in Germany in 2018 as part of their lecture series on the life and times of Sir Winston Churchill. And I was struck not only by the great pride which they took with their association with Winston Churchill, but also the inspiration they took from his courage, his leadership, and his strategic insights. But tell us more about the regiment today. I'm delighted to introduce Captain Jonathan Neese. Good afternoon. My name is Captain Jonathan Neese and I'm the adjutant of the Queen's Royal Hussars. We are the senior light cavalry regiment of the British Army and are currently a heavy armour regiment. That means that we are mounted on Challenger 2 tanks and are specialists in armoured warfare. I'm speaking to you today for two reasons. Firstly, the regiment are exceptionally proud to be known as Churchill's Own because as you've just heard, Winston Churchill was an officer in the 4th Queen's Own Hussars. And secondly, oh, I'm personally very proud, as I'm an alumni of Berkhamsted School, who the family will remember uh, was the school of Clementine Churchill. And we still have a house named in her honour. I wanted to talk about three things today. Firstly, how did Churchill end up joining the 4th Hussars? Secondly, some anecdotes and funny stories about his time in the 4th Hussars, especially in India. Uh, looking at some of the records that we still have at the mess. And then finally, who we are now and what we are as a regiment. So first of all, Churchill found out that he had been accepted into Sandhurst in 1893, whilst on a walking holiday in Switzerland. This was his third attempt to get into Sandhurst. The previous two attempts, he had failed to gain the academic qualifications or score to get into Sandhurst. But on his third attempt, he was successful. However, he had only just scraped over the line. So his father expressed his immediate disappointment that he hadn't done well enough to uh, qualify for an infantry cadetship, something that he had already organised with the Duke of Cambridge to commission into the 60th Rifles. Instead, he was stuck having to join the cavalry. What a shame. And so whilst his father expressed quite a, dis or a lot of disappointment at uh, Churchill's failure to gain an infantry cadetship, his aunt, uh, Duchess Lily, was much more positive and wrote him days after he found out the news, saying, never mind the infantry, you'll love the cavalry, and when Papa gets back, we will get you your charger. However, as overjoyed as Churchill was that it was going to be the cavalry life for him, he found out just before he went to Sandhurst that in fact many of the officer cadets had failed to take up their place, meaning he'd slowly gone up that ranking, meaning that he had indeed qualified for the 60th Rifles. And while I'm sure you will appreciate uh, Sandhurst is still the centre of officer leadership for all officers in the British Army, and Churchill's experience there differed somewhat from, who, from some of our junior officers who are here this evening, in fact, in his first week at Sandhurst, he wrote to his father to say, I have little or nothing to do. Very different from nowadays, I'm sure. He also wrote in his opening letters that he really had three issues at Sandhurst. The fact that the carpets and the curtains didn't match. They had a particularly solemn company butler. And finally, his father refused to pay his mess bill, something my father still refuses to do nowadays. However, while at Sandhurst, he did find some solace in the horses in the stables at the back of Old College. He spent time at Sandhurst playing for the regimental polo team, a real passion of his, and something that our junior officers still partake in today. However, never one to be put down, Winsor was convinced that the cavalry was where his heart was. And so he wrote to his father to explain the six key reasons why he needed to join the cavalry and not the infantry. First of all, Promotion is much quicker in the cavalry. Honestly, that's something I'm yet to come across, but Colonel, maybe we'll have a chat. <laughs> Second, gaining a commission in the cavalry was much quicker. 
There was no requirement to go on subsequent training. You only had, had to learn how to ride, which he already knew how to do very well. Third, the four hussars had already been told they were going to India. So he could go overseas. He could do the thing that he had joined the army to do, to see action, be gallant, and get medals. Fifth, stabling a horse in the cavalry was much easier. Clearly, they have stables, the farriers, the vets, which was a curious argument, given that at the time, he didn't own any horses and didn't for quite some time asking the regiment to buy them for him. And finally, a combination of the exceptionally smart uniforms, some of which you'll see this evening at dinner, the quality of life as a cavalry officer, the better social quality of the officers around you, and finally, and I'm sure we can all agree, the benefits of not having to walk everywhere. <laughs> After visiting the Fourth Hussars in an unusual absence from Sandhurst, he wrote back to his father expressing how impressed he'd been with Colonel Brabazon, then the commanding officer of the Fourth Hussars, and his awfully smart regiment, where he knew that he could exploit his single talent in life, horse riding. However, Lord Randolph, not one to be swayed easily, said, get these ideas of uh, joining the cavalry out of your head, at least while I'm alive. And so, a week after Lord Randolph's death, he wrote to the Duke of Cambridge requesting a, a transfer to the Fourth Hussars, which he dutifully accepted. Once in the Fourth Hussars in order shot, he got straight into horse riding lessons. However, he was already exceptionally proficient and the course, which usually takes 12 months, he completed in three. His only comments was that the horses that the Fourth Hussars had were much broader than the polo ponies he was used to, and he ended days with particular stiffness in his hips and back. Now, this is an indicator that, again, life as an officer in the 1800s was maybe somewhat easier than some of the experiences our officers have today. However, I am intending on bringing back his 10.30 hot bath and massage before then an imperial pint of champagne and a double brandy for lunch. <laughs> After a short break in 1896, where he went to New York and Cuba, he then returned to the regiment to prepare for a nine-year stint in India. This is fairly common in the army, and even recently, the Queen's Royal Hussars have returned from over 20 years of overseas service in Germany in 2019. But whilst in India with the regiment, he wrote back to his mother and brother very regularly to tell them how hard it was. In fact, between the particularly poor standard of local polo, the poor standard of local horse racing, and being constantly orderly officer, he was basically in prison. However, despite his state of arrest, he was still able to play polo for the regiment. And we've already heard today about some of the competitions he played in, one of which was the Secundabad Polo Tournament Trophy. At the Fourth Hussars at this uh, tournament, they won uh, a silver cup uh, to commemorate their success, something that we still have in the mess uh, displayed today. They also played in, in the May Root Army Interregimental Polo Cup final and won, meaning that they were the best polo team in the army. And by complete coincidence, I do promise, only six weeks ago, the regimental polo team won back the title of Army Polo Champions. Now, we've already heard how tough life was for Churchill when he was in, in India, uh, between his morning massage and lunchtime champagne. And whilst I wasn't able to bring some of the original documents and memorabilia that we hold in the mess, I thought I would share with you some of our favorite comments that uh, he wrote. We have a complaints book in the mess where any officer who feels their opinion is not being heard and needs to get it out there can write down what they want to say, uh, and it, it will be recorded in history. And so, whilst it is difficult to read some of his handwriting, I'll read some excerpts for you now. You'll notice he had some very peculiar um, or particular interests in food and furniture. So, looking at the top left, it says, in the opinion of Winston Churchill, the general comfort and furnishings of the mess are much below the standard of all other cavalry regiments and most of the infantry regiments. He suggests that fresh furniture be purchased new carpets be imported, and that hideous wallpaper be altered, so that the mess in general is rendered more suitably to the dignity of the regiment. A few months later, he noticed none of this had happened, so wrote a subsequent comment saying, maybe the mess should just be carpeted. Why has no action of the former complaint been taken? Maybe the state of discomfort is intentional. Secondly, looking at food, he wrote, the Irish stew needs to be more watery, not too rich or too thick, and not too much mince. Curious. And then finally, and our favorite quote is called eggs on toast. To prevent the toast all going sodden, 
the egg should first be placed on a piece of stale, dry toast. This absorbs the moisture. Then transfer to a piece of hot, fresh toast. If this method is adopted, it will save the unanimous complaints of soggy egg on toast. <laughs> Hopefully that's given you a bit of an idea of why he came to the regiment and his particularly tough life whilst there as a cavalry officer in the 1800s. And so what we're going to do now is just look at who the regiment are now. So clearly we have a very long history. This is our family tree, and the Queen's Royal Hussars were an amalgamation on the 1st of September 1993 of the Queen's Own and the Queen's Royal Irish Hussars, both of whom were amalgamations in turn in 1958. So the Queen's Own Hussars were an amalgamation of the 3rd King's Own Hussars and the 7th Queen's Own Hussars, whilst the Queen's Royal Irish Hussars were an amalgamation of the 4th Queen's Own Hussars and the 8th King's Royal Irish Hussars. As you can see, Sir Winston Churchill was the Colonel-in-Chief of the Queen's Own Hussars before handing over on amalgamation to the late Prince Philip. More about the regiment. So uh, as you can see in the top left and the top right and some of the photos around, we're an operational main battle tank regiment uh, using Challenger 2 uh, tanks. In our... Uh, in our history, we've had over 172 battle honours and have uh, eight VC winners. The regiment is about 500 strong, and the majority of our soldiers come from Northern Ireland or Birmingham. Since amalgamation in 1993, we've had multiple tours of Kosovo, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and most recently, we've been um, uh, over in Estonia as part of the NATO Enhanced Forward Presence, as part of the deterrence mission out there um, uh, for aggression in the Baltic states. If you have any questions, uh, myself and my fellow officers will be in the bar this evening uh, dressing our uh, finery. Please come up and ask me then. Apologies to the online crowd. But what we're going to do now is see a small video uh, which encapsulates what the regiment's all about. Thank you very much for your time.
now going to adjourn. <laughs>